Our scripture lesson this morning is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 13. And once again, we're in the midst of our Ask a Pastor uh, series. Some of the Ask a Pastors have been uh, questions that have regard in, been in regards to topics, such as last Sunday. We looked at the topic of what does the Bible say about homosexuality, and, and that's a, it's a really a timely topic and irrelevant and one that's that's uh, coming at our society and culture and even our church. And uh, now, but not all the questions are topical. Some of the questions are about passages of Scripture. Uh, and this is one of them this morning where somebody has been reading in their studies and they've said, uh, I don't understand where this one fits. I don't understand what the uh, author is trying to say. I don't understand what God is trying to say to me through this scripture. And so uh, I've gotten some of those questions. We'll be dealing with them. And this is one of them from 2 Timothy, Paul's letter, second letter to Timothy. Uh, I'll be reading verses 11 through 13. Uh, the apostle says uh, in his letter, the saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him or disown him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's a good word for us this morning. Let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for your word to us. Thank you for your spirit, even now, moving in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to have ears and hearts and a receptivity and a sensitivity to whatever your spirit would say to us. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you are aware that about 10 days ago, uh, we got back from a mission trip to Cuba in which I had about 34 of us total on the team. Uh, most of the team were teenagers, were youth uh, that went. And that was one of the largest teams, that was the largest team I'd ever taken into Cuba. I've taken larger teams on mission trips before, but this was the biggest one to Cuba. And, uh, and by being a, a youth, a lot of youth on the team, that naturally flavors things a little bit in, in a certain way of doing things. But I just want to say again, that what a great mission that was. What a great ministry time that was. And, and uh, I, I was blessed, and I think the young people that went were blessed, and I'm, certainly, uh, I'm certain that the church and that the believers and that the people of Cuba were blessed by that team and by our uh, eight or nine days that we were there in the country. I say all that to say this this morning, to ask you a question. How many of you would like to go on a mission trip with me? Not, not very many hands around this morning. I, I wasn't meaning right now. I was thinking about down the road somewhere sometime. But how many would like to go on a mission trip sometime with me? Okay, where? Well, uh, let, let me, let me uh, th th that was sort of a trick question, okay? And you knew that. You knew that was coming. And here, here is the trick. You already are. You already are on a mission trip with me. I, I, I've said it before. You've heard me say it. I'm a pastor, yes, but, but I'm a missionary at heart. I'm a missionary pastor. And so whether you like it or not, and whether you realize it or not, you are already on my mission team, and we're already on a mission trip right here, right now. I, I, want, you, I, I want you to get this perspective. I want you to get this into your mind and into your heart. I want us to start thinking this way, that we are on a mission trip. Now, you don't need, you don't need a U.S. passport for this, okay? Some of you might have one, but you, don't need, but you do need a spiritual passport. You do need a spiritual passport. Well, what's a passport do? A passport gives you your identification, who you are, where you live, your background, uh, on, on and on. You, you, do need to, you do need to know who you are in Christ, okay? You do need a spiritual passport of identification to be on this mission team. 
But you are. You're on the mission team. And our focus, what is our focus? Well, our focus, our mission is to reach the unreached. Our focus is to reach the last, the least, and the lost. Our focus is to, is to go after those who don't know yet the love of God in Jesus Christ. They don't know the good news. They don't know what God has done for them. They don't know the power of the blood of Jesus. They don't know the name of Jesus yet. They haven't experienced it. They haven't been touched by it. And so our job, our mission, that's our mission. That's our focus is on the unreached. Well, you don't need to take any Rosetta Stone language learning classes necessarily for this mission trip. But you do need to know how to speak their language. Okay? Okay. See, we have a tendency to speak our own language. And if you've been in the church for very long, chances are you've learned to speak churchese and Christianese. And, and we've, forgotten how, we've forgotten what it sounds like to speak in the tongue of the last, the lost, and the least. We've forgotten that we need to speak their language. If they're going to hear us, if we're going to truly communicate the gospel to them, we've got to speak in their language. We gotta speak their language. And that's hard to do sometimes. Because, you know, in any in learning any language, you gotta tune your ear. My my son Matt, some of you know who that is. My son Matt speaks fluent Spanish. And he has a he has a gift for the languages. And he translates for children's hospital in Columbus, some of the other hospitals, and he's able to adjust his accent to the El Salvadorans and the Hondurans and the Cubans and the and the and the uh, Brazilians or not Brazilians, but the uh, Colombians, different Spanish dialects and, and language and accents. But he has learned to adapt to them. In order to be effective. Now, if you don't want to be effective, then you keep right on speaking your language. If you want to be effective, if you want to reach them, then you got to learn their language on this mission trip that we're on. And, and, and listen, in order, to, in order to be on this mission trip, it, it's, you got, I, I need to say it, we got to cross some barriers. We got to get out of our comfort zone. That ought not to be something new. But listen to me. A missionary, what do they say? A missionary is not somebody who crosses the sea. It's somebody who sees the cross and is willing to get out of their comfort zone for the, in the sake of Jesus to reach them. We're, we're on a mission trip. You didn't know that, but you already are on one. We're on a mission trip and we're crossing barriers. And I said this to the team in Cuba, and I've said it here before, but I want to say it again. And that is, listen, on this mission trip that we're on, unity matters. The the unity here matters. You you see, we, we, we will be ineffective to reaching this world unless we are one, even as the Father and the Son are one, unless we love each other and care for each other and serve one another. You see, that's the power of the, of, of the Spirit of God when we humble ourselves and are in unity with one another. Oh, listen, uh, this coming up here in August, I got to tell you, on August the 20th, Bishop Mel and I are so excited because we sense God is up to something incredible. On August the 20th, that's a Saturday, you got it in your bulletin, I think, this morning, and you'll hear more about it, but we're planning to have an, what, what we're calling the Eastern Gate uh, Prophetic Unity Conference. It's a Saturday. It'll start in this afternoon. Pastor Scott Kelso will teach a a leadership on a unity class in the afternoon to pastors and church leaders. And then in the evening, we'll have worship and we'll have a couple speakers who will be speaking about unity. Listen, how many of you know it's time for the church to be the church? Eastern Gate, where did that come from? Well, it came from a prophecy. That was given a number of years ago at this church. Now, I wasn't here then, and so I've had to do some investigating. What does that mean, Eastern Gate? Well, uh, I, I know from the Bible that the gate 
was a place of entrance into the city. And here we are, just a mile or less off of I-70. We are on the eastern gate of the city of Columbus. We are the, on the entrance side, but a gate is also a place where people exit the city as yeah. well and are launched. So the eastern gate, we're an entry place and we're also an exit place. But listen, the gate in the Bible also served a third purpose. And that is that the gate was a place of authority. It was a place of, of judgment. They would have court. They would set up court right there in the gate of the city. And legal transactions were taken care of. Legal uh, decisions were being made. And listen, as the eastern gate... Here at Trinity, I believe that God has given us a certain amount of authority and he's given us a legal position. In fact, as we've said before, and you'll hear it more times, I don't think it's an accident that Resurrection Ministries uh, for all people and Bishop Mel and myself and our churches have joined together because, listen, God has given us a unique platform. We can, we can talk about unity here. There's a lot of churches that can't talk about unity, but we can talk about unity here because we're living it, we're walking it out, we're learning what that means. And because of that, it gives, it gives us a position of authority. It gives us a position of, of power. And I, and I don't know, there, I'm sure there's other churches in the area, but I know that Trinity is uniquely positioned to call the church to be the church on the east side of Columbus. Amen? So, mark August 20th on your calendar. It's a Saturday. Uh, and, and plan on coming that evening because I believe, and there's churches from all over the area have already been starting to respond that they're going to be here. They're going to send their congregations. We're going to see what, we're going to see what happens. But one thing is for sure. I know that God is calling us to unity because listen, the, you, you cannot be effective on a mission trip unless the team is on one, on the same page, unless the team is in unity together, unity of the spirit. I'm not talking about institutional unity. I'm not talking about political unity. I'm not talking about economic unity. I'm talking about spiritual unity based upon the Word of God. So on a mission trip, how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we serve one another matters. It matters. In fact, I've, been on, I've seen teams before uh, I remember a number of years ago, one of the youth ministry at one of my former churches, uh, they, were ha they were out in, uh, at a uh, Native American Indian reservation out in, I don't know, Arizona someplace. And their team of young people were at each other's throats. They were, they were nitpicking about this and whining and complaining about this. And the youth pastor called me up on the trip. I was back home. Uh, and he said, what do I do? He says, this is, this is out of control. And I said, stop the mission trip. Stop the mission trip until you have a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> and I said, you need to focus on your relationships. God will take care of the mission. You focus on your unity. God will take care of reaching the people. Maybe, maybe that's what's wrong with the church today. The world thinks that the church is irrelevant. Oh, we don't have time for that foolishness. Maybe it's because they see a church that's petty, a church that's picking, a church that's not in unity, a church that's biting at each other, paying, getting distracted by the stupidest little arguments and stuff. But you see, when we're in unity, oh my goodness. Be on a mission trip. You cannot afford to let your attitude slip. Just telling you, when I'm in communist Cuba with a mission team, I have to, whether I like it or not, have to keep my attitude in the right place. Now, it's a whole lot easier when my wife is not along, because when my wife is along, she makes sure my attitude is in the right place. Do <laughs> you like that? Just kidding, dear, just kidding. But it's true. 
Do, do, you suppose, do you suppose that unity of the Spirit is so important to the Lord that He intentionally brings brother and sister sandpaper into the congregation just for you? Just so that you'll learn how to love those who are hard to love. Oh, I'm serious. This, this is a t- unity of the team is a major piece of spiritual warfare. And we will be as effective as we are unified or ineffective as we are in disunity. On a mission team, listen, on a, on a, on a mission team, uh, mission trip, it, it's not about our comfort. It's not about our conven- uh, convenience. I told the team in Cuba, we, we're not tourists. We're not touristas. We're, we are missionaries. And listen, I believe that every Christian is a missionary. Every one of us has been called on a mission. If you name the name of Christ, you are a missionary. Somebody has said it this way. Either you are a missionary or you are the mission field. Which one are you? Either you're a missionary or you're on the mission field, or you are the mission field, which one is it going to be? Listen, it's not about our comfort or our convenience. You know, if, if, if tourists are the ones that are worried about comfort and convenience, not missionaries. I remember when years ago when I would take the teams uh, to Mexico, we would ride a bus for three days from Columbus, from Etna, Ohio, all the way down to Monterey, Mexico, and back three days uh, at the end of the trip. I mean, those were grueling days. But every time we'd start out on the trip, before we get ready for the trip, I'd say, all right, and then mostly it was young people, I said, how many of you want to eat worms and sleep on the floor and have bugs run? up your nose every hand would go up because they understood that that actually didn't happen but I'm just saying I mean the, the bug up the nose that didn't really happen but I'm just telling you if you want convenience if you want comfort then be a tourist stay home you have no business in the mission the mission calls for a sacrifice It calls for a sacrifice. Here at Trinity, we are not a cruise ship. We are a battleship. And on battleships, listen to me, on battleships, there are no non-essential personnel. You don't take sightseers on battleships. Everybody on a battleship is part of the mission. Now listen, that doesn't mean that everybody knows what their mission is, although it's our job to make sure everybody's trained and everybody knows what the mission is. But listen, this is not not a cruise ship. This is not not a a, a tourist uh, type of... We are not a party, popular uh, cruise ship. If you're looking for that kind of a church, I can recommend some in the area for you. But we are a battleship, and we're about the mission, and we're focused on reaching the last and the lost. You see, our mission, listen to me, this is our mission. Our mission is to love God, and our mission is to help people know the love of God. Our mission is to capture as many people as we can find with the love of God. Capture them with the love of God. So that they're totally captured by God's love. That's our job. Talk about a simple mission. That's it. Whatever we got to do to tell people, to show people, to make it clear to them that they are loved by God. That he loves them so much that he sent his only begotten son for them in order that they might have life and not death. Listen, that's our mission. Our mission is to to tell people about God's love. Our mission is to hunt for the treasure that's out there. That's what I told the team in Cuba. I said, said, Jesus is already in Cuba. We're not bringing Jesus to Cuba. But Jesus is there, and we're going to play hide and seek with Jesus. He's already there, and he's buried treasure all over this island, all over this this area. And we're going to find where the treasure is hidden. We're going to play hide-and-seek with Jesus. Okay, i got to say it. This Pokemon 
phenomenon that's sweeping the country and the world is uh, it is utter, utter, utter ridiculous. And I'm sorry if that offends you, but I'm telling you that is all fantasy. What I'm talking about this morning is real. You understand? There are people, <laughs> it is so stiff, silly. There are people that have driven into trees. There are people that have walked off of cliffs trying to find the Pokemon monsters on their, on their handheld device. It's all fantasy. It, none of it is real. It's all virtual. They're capturing these simple, simple monsters, silly monsters. Uh, there are people that have been robbed because of, of ambushes that have been set up. It is the dumbest thing. But maybe, maybe the reason why that is so, so popular and, so, and spreading so much is because people have no concept of what is real, and they're looking for an escape. I can tell them where the escape is. The escape is to go bury, hunting for buried treasure, finding Jesus. And you don't need a handheld device for that. But you do need to have spiritual eyes and ears to see where he's already working, what he's already doing, and then become a part of that. I'm telling you, the kids in, when on our team in Cuba, they caught fire with this, and they understood what it was about, and it was exciting to see them spreading the love of God through those flowers, and to see God ch change the atmosphere in a room, to see God put a smile on somebody's face, a toothless face. It was, it was incredible to see as they discovered Jesus, not a Pokemon monster, but the real thing. You see, what the enemy has done, the enemy has created a counterfeit. And the reason why that counterfeit is spreading is because the church is not doing its job. We have forgotten that we're on a mission. We need that perspective. And see, listen, this is the way it works. That, that when we get a hold of the perspective, or the right perspective, it it will, it will fan into flame the passion, and then the passion will unfold the purpose in your lives. Maybe sometimes churches and individuals are, don't know their purpose because they've lost perspective and they don't have passion for, for what's real. And so consequently, the purpose has not been revealed or unfolded for them yet. Listen, I, I believe that we're in a time right now where uh, a shift is occurring. Uh, a stage is being set. To, to use the uh, famous line from Dickens, we are in the worst of times and the best of times. And we really are. I mean, and, and I, you know, just want to tell you, I think it's going to get worse. Really worse. We haven't seen anything yet. But I also believe it's the best of times. And we're going to see a revival. We're going to see some amazing things happen. Listen, I, I tell you all that. You're thinking, well, he's probably forgotten all about the Scripture. No, th this is what the Scripture is about. You see, Paul wrote to Timothy... And these were personal letters. This is different from, F, from the book of Ephesians or the book of Galatians or the book of First and Second Corinthians. Paul was writing a personal letter to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. Timothy was a son of the faith. He probably was led to the Lord through Paul's ministry. And Paul discipled young Timothy. And then as he uh, left him there as the pastor of the church of Ephesus. But it was a personal letter that Paul was writing to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, in all likelihood, this was his last letter. Because now Paul's in chains. This is, this is not the same situation that you read about at the, at the end of the book of Acts. At the end of Acts, Paul had, had been uh, sent to Rome. He was under house arrest. His trial came before Caesar, and it was basically thrown out. 
because there was no evidence or nothing to substantiate the charges. And so Paul was released from that house arrest. He went on, tradition says, to Spain and to the other parts of the Mediterranean. There he was arrested and he was brought back to Rome. But this time it's not house arrest. This time he's in chains in a Roman prison. And he's writing his last letter knowing that execution is next. And he's going to die. And Paul, writing to Timothy, who's now the pastor of Ephesus, but also just writing to Timothy, his dear son in the faith, Paul is trying to encourage him because Paul is concerned for the churches during this time of suffering and persecution that they are facing under Emperor Nero. And listen, I'm not going to read the whole letter, of course, to you, but I want to read, I want to read some excerpts from Paul's personal, intimate letter to young Timothy. And he says these things, beginning in verse 6, chapter 1, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or self-control. Paul says in verse 8, he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul was a prisoner. But share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to holy, a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Verse 14, Paul says, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Do you know that the Holy Spirit has deposited something in you? He's invested in you. He's planted things in you that you don't even know yet. Gifts of the Spirit, resources, talents, abilities that you haven't found out or haven't figured out how to use. But he's planted them. Now guard those, that which is entrusted to you. Guard that good deposit. And let God's Spirit bring it to fruition in our lives during The days come what may. Chapter 2, Paul says, And then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strengthened. Verse 3, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian, civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think it over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And then beginning in chapter 3, Paul says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, Paul tells Timothy. Right in the middle of this letter, right in the middle of this letter is our text this morning. And, and what happens is Paul's writing this out of, from his heart. He's, he's praying for, he's thinking about, he's loving this young pastor, Timothy. He knows the persecution. He knows the suffering. Paul himself is in chains in a dank, dark Roman prison. Yeah, yeah. And right in the middle of his letter, Paul breaks out in a hymn. <laughs> he breaks out in a song. And, and by the way, listen, that, that's a good thing. I grew up in small little churches, country churches, where my dad was the pastor. 
And most of the time, I think I probably was not paying attention, but those words of those hymns were still sinking in, whether I knew it or not. And you know, uh, in the early service this morning, Ben had us singing, I surrender all. I didn't need to look at the screen. I knew those words of that. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. On and on, you and I Hymns will come. Songs that we sang even this morning. You may not remember the whole song, but, but listen, there's something powerful about the hymns and about the music that sinks down deeper than just your head into your heart and into your spirit, and it finds lodging there. And so it's not a surprise that right in the middle of Paul's letter to Timothy, a hymn wells up from deep, an ancient hymn. Four things that Paul quotes in that hymn was our text. Let me read them to you and show you what he's saying. Right in the midst of it, he said, This is a trustworthy saying. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. What Paul is saying there is, Timothy, remember the essence of salvation. You see, listen to me this morning very carefully. Jesus is not an add-on. You don't, you don't just add him on to your busy schedule, your busy and full agenda. You don't add him on to your good deeds and all the other things that you're doing. No, Jesus is either Lord of your life or he's not Lord at all. He's the master of it all. And in order for Jesus to, in order for you to be saved, let's put it that way, in order for you to be saved, you've got to die. That's what he's saying there. Well, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's right. He took our place. He took your place, my place, and he took my sins when he died on the cross. And by faith in Jesus, I died with him. My old sin nature, my own way, my own wants, and what I want to do. The Tim, Tim Burden died 2,000 years ago. Yes, he died on the cross with Christ. And because he died in, in his old sin nature, he has now been raised to new life yes. in Jesus. That's what baptism is a symbol of. Yes. Baptism is a symbol of our death, burial, and resurrection to new life. Yes. And listen to me. You don't have new life. This morning, unless you have died, you got religion, but you don't have new life. You don't have this new life until there's been a death. You see, that's what repentance is. Repentance means to change direction, to die to self. You change your mind. You were going that way in your sin, and now you've changed direction. You're going this way with Jesus. That's called repentance. And too many times, listen, too many times people try to follow Jesus, but they have never died to self. And they are fooling themselves. That's my point. They're just fooling themselves. And Paul says it right here. If you've died with him, then you will live with him for all of eternity. Secondly, he says, he said, to, he said, endure. In other words, walk it out. In other words, it's not just about being saved. It's also about discipleship. It's also about following Jesus. And the word there for endure is the word uh, that has to do with uh, patience or bearing up under it. How many of you know that we're under a lot of stress these days? There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of attacks that are going on in the world today. And in our individual lives and families are under severe attack i telling you, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And so therefore, we need to learn how to endure and to persevere, bearing up under it. And God's Spirit will enable us to do that. In fact, this is where the spiritual disciplines come in. Spiritual disciplines such as prayer and reading the Bible every day, even if it's just a little bit. But spiritual disciplines of fasting and, and serving and, and plugging in. When we exercise those spiritual disciplines, it gives us a backbone to be able to stand up under the pressure. Too many times I find that Christians crash and burn because they've not built in their spiritual, they've not learned how to endure. They've not learned how to persevere. 
Thirdly is a warning. Paul says, if you, if you disown or deny me, deny the Lord, he will deny and disown you. It's a warning. If you choked on that one, good. <laughs> you were supposed to. We all are. Because that's a serious thing. And listen, you can deny and, deno- and, and disown him, not just with your words, but also with your lifestyle, also with your actions and your behavior. You can deny that you even know the Lord by your behavior. It's the truth. And he says, if you deny me, Jesus said, I'll deny you before the Father. And then finally, Paul says, that if we are faithless, uh, this is the best part, God is still faithful because he can't be anything else. Even when we stumble and fall, even when we blow it left and right, God is faithful and he'll not let go. He will hold you. Why? Because God is faithful. He can't be anything else but faithful. Listen, this morning, that was Paul's confidence. And he was telling Timothy, this is your confidence. Be, you can be confident in the Lord. Listen to me, where is your confidence this morning? Where is your confidence at? As I close this morning again, the perspective will lead to the passion and the passion will lead to the purpose. And I, I have a word for you this morning. This is a word, I, I, the Lord gave me this while I was praying before the service started this morning, before anybody arrived. And the Lord told me to tell you this. Don't waste your life. Don't waste the life. Don't waste your life. Don't don't waste another day. Don't don't waste what he's deposited in you. Don't waste your life. Don't waste another moment. If God is speaking to you this morning, you need to surrender. You need to yield. You need to renew. You need to let go. You need to receive this morning. You need to be filled with with the Holy Spirit. Because, listen, we are on a mission trip together this morning. You get to sleep in your own bed. You get to eat at your own table. But make no mistake, you're on a mission trip. Don't waste it. I've seen many young people on this trip, but also on many other trips that I've led, they come back changed. Not because of me, but because the Holy Spirit showed up and touched them. And they realized, oh my goodness, God can use little old me to change other people's lives, to make a difference, to encourage people with the love of God. Father, this morning I thank you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And right now, Lord, we just want to open up our hearts. Lord, we didn't realize of it. Maybe some of us forgot we were on a mission trip. We thought it was about our comfort and convenience. We thought we were tourists. We thought we were on a sightseeing voyage. Lord, now we understand we are on a mission trip. And Lord, we're not going to waste any more days. Show us how. Help us, oh God, to share your love with the least, the last, and the lost and to capture them with the love of God. Help us, oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me for our closing prayer?
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.